please share with once you get all this once you get all this information um, through whatever form, it'll probably come at you cross-posting uh, Blizzard. But um, that's because we want to get as much public comment into this process as possible. So please uh, participate, share, encourage, and uh, hopefully we can really do an amazing update to climate literacy. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Hey, everybody. I'm Jen Kretzer. I'm the Director of Climate Initiatives at the Wild Center, and I am facilitating the call today. And so it looks like folks are starting to introduce themselves in the chat. Um, so please do so if you haven't already. That would be great. And again, if we have any announcements, um, we can put those right into the chat. But I'll go right into... Um, uh, introducing today's topic, which I'm super excited about. So we have a team <clears throat> with us from um, South Florida, from Broward, Miami, Dade, Dade and Palm Beach counties um, that are all working on youth voice and leadership, which is a subject near and dear to my heart, as many of you know. Um, and they are going to be talking um, about the um, Broward Youth Climate Summit, the FAU Climate Ready Program, um, and their regional, and uh, Megan and Kim will be talking about their regional approach to understanding community vulnerabilities to climate change and their efforts to creating adaptation and mitigation strategies in that region of the country. Um, so we have with us today, uh, Rachel Wellman, um, Lisa, M uh, sorry, I'm gonna pronounce your name incorrectly, Melankovic. Uh, Megan Houston and Kimberly Brown, and I'll just let you each maybe um, introduce yourselves when you start um, start speaking. So please um, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you so much. Are you able to see my presentation? Okay. Yes. Now you're in Perfect. presenter mode. Great. Beautiful. Beautiful. So uh, thank you so much uh, for this time and space uh, together. Um, we are here to represent sunny South Florida and provide you with another look at climate resilience education in our area. Um, I'm Rachel Wellman. I represent Florida Atlantic University Pine Dog Environmental Education Center. And joining me today are these three amazing ladies involved in climate literacy, res resilience, education, and action um, in South Florida. So a quick overview of what we wanted to do today was a, just a quick introduction of South Florida. Um, we already had a, a little bit of an introduction on that, so I'll elaborate a little bit. And then we'll hear from each of the four of us, and then hopefully there will be some time for questions and open discussion. So South Florida, what do we mean by uh, South Florida in this sense is Southeast Florida region. It includes Broward, Miami-Dade, uh, Monroe, and Palm Beach counties. We are a very heavily populated area with many environmental and climate-related vulnerabilities. You can actually see from this map um, on, along the coast, it's uh, suburbs and metropolis area. It's actually on Wikipedia. It was called the satellite imagery of the Miami metropolitan area, which actually includes Palm Beach County all the way down to Monroe, so I thought that was interesting. This dark space up here is actually Lake Okeechobee, which is a very important part um, of our uh, watershed and um, in including in our uh, vulnerabilities. This area here actually used to be all Everglades, considered uh, the Florida Everglades, but much of it um, in the north in our county and Palm Beach County has now been transferred into uh, agricultural land, um, which has, of course, added to some, some issues. Uh, so we'll go, move forward. In, uh, in our issues, we have three main hazards that we've identified in our area, and that is, of course, extreme heat, um, increased storm intensity, and flooding. So Today, we wanted to address what are some of the things that our community is doing to address these. Again, today um, we'll be meeting with myself, Rachel. My um, next to me is Letha, representing the Broward County Schools. Uh, Megan is from the Palm Beach County Office of Resilience, and Kimberly Brown, she's from the Miami Dade um, County Office of Resilience. 
So I would like to say that I actually represented the Palm Beach County School District um, uh, as we were developing this program called, we call Climate Ready. The Ready stands for Resilience Education and Action for Dedicated Youth. And it was designed to empower our teens and hence the youth, uh, but also our teachers and to hopefully help our community be more resilient to change. Um, in June of 2022, I accepted the position as program lead. So I'm happy to say that I've been full time and working uh, with this program at Pine Jog. So what is Pine Jog a little bit? Uh, there is, the, we are located at the uh, West Palm, in West Palm Beach, Florida on 135 acres of pine flatwood forest. Since 1960, we've offered a wide range of programming opportunities for K through 12 students, educators, and the community with the mission of cultivating environmentally literate and engaged citizens. The purpose of Climate Ready is to help young people and teachers develop the knowledge, skills, and confidence to respond at the local level by becoming uh, climate resilience leaders in their own communities. At its core, the program aims to prepare students and teachers to educate others about how both individually and together, we can better prepare for the impacts of our changing climate, extreme weather, and other, other environmental challenges we face in South Florida. The program uses um, a local place-based approach to focus on six core communities within our county that are among the most vulnerable to extreme heat, stronger storms, and sea level rise, and other climate impacts. Its goal is to prepare participants in each of these communities to educate and involve younger students, teachers, and local residents in climate resilience efforts. So we had teams uh, of each of these. We are a formal education um, center, and so with FAU, we provided dual enrollment opportunities for students that over three semesters, starting in the summer with our Ambassador Institute. Um, they spent a week at one of our campuses in-house, and we had an intense week of Climate Change 101 or Climate 101, along with resilience education. And afterwards, we Followed that by an after school mentorship, which we partnered with um, Title I elementary schools all over the county, uh, sharing our uh, information and what we've learned in terms of climate change and our vulnerabilities and our strengths and, and possible solutions. And so together we work as a community to create our own story. Then uh, lastly, our spring semester is our community outreach portion, which we're in right now. And uh, we actually were able to reach out to some of the more agricultural areas in Pahoka Gale Glade, which is we've learned a great deal from. Um, and we've also had a teacher collaborative um, that has been ongoing for the last couple of years. So the last, the next two slides are just some photos, wonderful photos of smiling faces, participants in our program. Um, from our teens uh, using the science on a sphere. We've used that actually with uh, all of them, all, all ages. That was a, a very important part. Hence the, the picture of the, the blue marble behind me. Um, this was a very inspiring tool to help uh, students see and visualize uh, what, what uh, the science behind our earth science and our climate science. And it really is impactful. As a matter of fact, I had a teacher PD yesterday and I had a teacher tell me that they were inspired by the, uh, the whole uh, professional development activity that they were more interested in science now. Um, so I don't wanna spend too much more time because I wanna give more time to my, my uh, colleagues, my friends here, uh, but just a couple of pictures to see um, all of these activities and um, ways in which we've been able to communicate with our community. And if you'd like more information on our program, there is a website. Um, and of course, emailing me is also an option. So thank you so much. And now Hi. I'll pass it to Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to throw this link in the chat so you can all go there instead of watching me. <laughs> no. 
but um, we're in our fifth year and I have a couple of people on the call to thank on my team is Rebecca Malonis and Summer Scarlatelli, I think are on there and Cheryl Ariola kind of got started with this learning, um, with a charge to have everyone do lessons around sea level rise, which is a big major issue in our area. We have a lot of flooding and during sunny days and our students see the flooding during sunny days and this way they can learn about it. So our first year was really all about sea level rise and we had 500 students in one large room and some vendors there that they can go around and see, but it was much smaller. By the second year we were in person and then we were lucky it was January of 2020 that we were able to have it in person before we closed in March. And we were at the Museum of Discovery and Science and we had about 800 students, three seatings of the IMAX theater there. And that um, had breakout sessions and every student had their own unique breakout sessions with the idea that they would go back to their class and share what they learned and it would be different than their friend and they would get to share more. The museum was a little bit distracting because we were on the main floor of the museum. So we spent some time having to corral, especially middle schoolers back into sessions. So we haven't done that. Um, then we went virtual in the third year. And, um, but basically the goal is to provide a platform for getting students to have a voice. We have a large debate program. They were always part of this. So teaching them to have a voice. And um, we have a partnership with our Broward County Natural Resources Division and the Museum of Discovery and Science for this and for lots of other things. And we can go to the next slide. I think we have some more pictures. So um, this year, actually I want to say with the third year when we were virtual, we were able to get um, Neil deGrasse Tyson as a keynote so that helped us grow our virtual audience to about 7,000 or so students broadcasting into classrooms via Teams. So we had maybe a thousand classrooms and then you know, whole classes are watching at the same time. And then we had breakout sessions in addition to the keynote. And he brought on Gavin Schmidt from NASA. From, and um, the two of them were able to answer questions from our students. And it's an episode of Star Talk. So if you wanted to hear what South Florida students are curious about with climate change and all about climate change, you can watch the Star Talk episode and I can try to find that link and put it in the chat as well. This year we're doing four parts. This We're trying to reach more students and we have different varieties of engagement. But none of it is really, well, we did a little virtual. So in December, we had 50 students that attended what we call the big summit, the adult summit, the um, Southeast Florida, Regional Climate Leadership Summit, which encompasses the four counties. So the three counties that are here on the call plus Monroe, and it rotates among the counties. And this year it was in um, Broward in person and we had 50 high school students attended. And it was great those, the students had um, little round table discussions with the keynote speakers separate from everyone else. But the best part was when they asked the questions they had no fear at all of standing up in front of the large group and asking their questions and getting them getting hard questions and getting them answered from the speakers. So that was really great. And then we had part two, we're still kind of recovering from it. We had 47 presenters and 900 attendees from 21 schools with 28 buses, which seems to be the, the difficult part of getting people around the county. For at a high school, we broke up into 29 breakout sessions and Cleo was the keynote speaker. We had a youth speaker and we are still recovering from it. I think that Summer and Rebecca definitely are too. And they all brought posters and they're great posters and they had a greeting from our commissioner. So that was part two. And if we go to the next slide, I think we'll hear about part three. We're having a workshop with University of South Florida sponsored by Coke Florida. So Coca-Cola was one of our sponsors for the main, for the whole, all four parts. And we have a workshop where they're gonna get rain barrels, kind of old syrup containers for, and retrofitting them with Coke, compliments of Coke and it's pie day. So we're gonna have a fun day. And then in April, we're gonna bring back 250 eighth graders, soon to be ninth graders. And they're gonna actually work on implementation of their climate action plans. So they have the background knowledge from, go. they're all students that have gone to the other summit and they're gonna come back in, at the museum and really get to work and collaborate between the schools. So that is gonna be fun and exciting. And next slide, I think that's it. 
So you can see the growth between virtual and in-person. This year, we had some virtual in December. We shared the link, but not a, not a whole lot. So I think we need to come back to some combination because obviously our engagement was really high in the, when we were totally virtual. So we want to have some sort of combination of the, the two so we can reach more, reach more, reach more than um, the 1200 or so that we're reaching this year between the 250 at the museum and the thousand we had just had and the 50 that we had in you know, the, all the different parts. And of course, we're going to reach like about 30 teachers at the teacher workshop in March so that those teachers will reach their students and their students, uh, you know, next year and, and hopefully continuously we'll be able to grow that program. But um, we need to see that combination of virtual and in person, you know, some live broadcast or some interesting speakers. So if any of you are interested in speaking, we're going to need more speakers for virtual. And I think that is it, unless we have another slide. I think that's it. Thanks, Lisa. This is Megan Houston. I'm from Palm Beach County. I'm the Resilience Director here. So I'm going to speak a little bit about what the county is doing um, within South Florida through our partnerships with the Southeast Florida Climate Compact <clears throat> and a little bit more about what we do as a county, how we're thinking about climate change and sustainability and um, how we're working on engaging our community to share what we do. So we're a team of three full-time people here where we work to make the county more sustainable for the planet. We care about sustainability, we care about resiliency, and specific to climate change. So you might hear about like cyber security resiliency or mental health resiliency. All of that is very important, but we do focus just on things related to climate change within the office. Next slide. Rachel highlighted a lot of our issues that maybe you've seen on the news um, related to heat and flooding. We have also looked at other climate change factors that are causing issues, right? We have saltwater intrusion. So our drinking water supplies are um, sometimes at risk. We have droughts, we have wildfires, certainly not like um, the Pacific Northwest, but we have those risks here. And then sea level rise isn't, sometimes we don't think of it as its own specific threat, but this kind of exacerbating factor, right? It's going to make tidal flooding worse. It'll make storm surge worse. Um, so the things that are related to blue, other than winds, those are where sea level rise is causing challenges for us. Next slide. We use this sea level rise projection curve that the partnership, this four county partnership um, decided upon on which models to use. So we um, in Palm Beach County, our board has adopted this as a planning tool. So when we do county capital construction projects, we look at this um, set of curves and we decide if we're doing something super long-term that's really important, like an emergency operations center, we might wanna be planning for sea level rise around the, on that red curve, right? So 54 inches of sea level rise by 2070. But if we're doing something that could have adaptive capacity, or maybe a shorter lifespan, we would um, we don't need to plan maybe as uh, risk adverse. So we could use the yellow or the purple curves. Next slide. I'll talk about what we're doing operationally right now. So we do a lot of these living shorelines um, developments on our coast. As you can see from this picture where we, instead of just doing seawalls, we integrate um, uh, oyster shells and other uh, riprap into creating these ecosystems. So along our coasts, we're having birds that have never, uh, um, birds are coming back and using these islands as their breeding grounds. So it's, it's these living shorelines concepts that have been really well done um, with the environmental department here. Next slide. We're lucky at the county that we have these in cross departmental teams. So I'm with the resilience office, we have an environmental department, but then 15 other departments who are tangentially or directly related to environmental protection meet up um, every couple of weeks to talk about issues that we can work on together. Our zoning folks, our parks department, our engineering team. And so some of the things that we focused on as a group 
are reducing single use plastic. We're presenting, we are presenting to our board on the bottom right, um, sharing with our community what the county is doing to reduce our waste. We've done some Earth Day outreach through proclamation. And then trees, trees are contentious in Palm Beach County sometimes, which you wouldn't think they would be, but some people hate them. Some people hate that they tear up the roads. People need a permit to put them in or a permit to take them out. And so we're trying to identify all the people related to trees um, within the county and work together so that we can find common ground on how to um, promote uh, green space and right place, right tree and all of that. Next slide. We focus on our energy efficiency here. We have a $30 million electric bill. So anything we can do to reduce that is good for Palm Beach County. So we've done um, HVAC sw swaps and lighting upgrades, as well as experimented with solar installations on-site and both off-site through community solar. Next slide. We work with our airports department. We've helped our airports um, update their sustainability management plan. Something simple that we're doing as a county that people really like are these bottle refill stations throughout the facilities. And we're also promoting electric vehicle permitting um, by removing barriers through our uh, code amendments. Next slide. And more on the electric vehicles, this is becoming more of a hot topic as the market is changing. So we're doing a couple of pilot projects where we're installing infrastructure and um, experimenting with zero emission buses, meaning that they are electric buses. We're building that infrastructure and acquiring buses soon. Next slide. And then finally, at, related to the county, as we were thinking about our operations, we're including resiliency and sustainability planning into how we build things. Next slide. And I'm going to skip because I know I'm oh, like short on time. So let's we've gotten a, awards for this as well. Um, we're working on a resilience um, vulnerability assessment and climate action plan right now. That's where we have um, worked with Rachel and her awesome FAU Pine Jog students. We're trying to identify risks and use community input to figure out how to plan for that. Next slide. So our um, the students help come and facilitate community workshops. So it was really cool to have them um, as we're asking residents, you know, non-technical experts, what is important to them? What should we try to protect? Students were able to come and see how that participatory workshop actually goes. Like, what does it actually mean to, you know, have community engagement? So I think on the third slide over, you can see um, some of the students in the red maybe and um, helping throughout the workshops, we would post it notes, and they also presented two minutes each on, you know, what climate change means to them and shared their story. And that kind of warmed up the crowd so that um, it was it was not just us talking, right? It was like people from the community also sharing what they're seeing. Next slide. So I'll just highlight a little bit about our strong partnership between Broward, Miami-Dade, Monroe. So the map that Rachel showed you on the first slide, we work together on climate change issues. We know that it doesn't, climate change doesn't care about jurisdictional boundaries. We, um, next slide. So we've been working together since 2010. We have um, different partnerships. We have a leadership committee. We have workshops and, and theme focused planning groups. Uh, we develop policy tools. We host events and summits um, and put a lot of, you know, try to coordinate our planning efforts so we're all building appropriately and not duplicating efforts. Next slide. We've produced three series of a regional climate action plan. The last came out last year. Next slide. And when we think about regional climate action plans, we don't just think about, you know, climate change as its own bucket. We think we take a broad spectrum as we look into various components of what that means. So we have sustainable communities and transportation, which um, Kim helped lead uh, the update there. And uh, we have equity, equity is its own chapter. We have agriculture. So really, you know, the idea is that this is a resource that people can pick and choose from and tailor these aspirational goals to um, 
uh, to what they need to do in their own jurisdictions. Next slide. Some of the things we're working on throughout the year, we're updating the mayor's pledge so our cities can reaffirm their commitment to doing what we're doing. We're hosting workshops to uh, try and increase um, planning efforts towards resilient housing and look at federal funding. We survey our municipalities to try and identify ways um, that people, are, that jurisdictions are progressing. And then of course we have our annual uh, summit, which is our big event and um, which uh, started out like a couple hundred people and now has uh, turned into a sold out annual conference that each of the four counties takes turn hosting through. So a lot going on and I'm happy to now turn it over to Kim to talk about Miami Dade County. Thanks, Megan. Um, and, and Megan uh, covered a lot about our, our regional vulnerabilities, so I, I won't focus too much on that, but uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing here in Miami-Dade County. Uh, okay, you can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, well, I'll just introduce myself as well. I'm, I'm Kimberly Brown, um, Director of Resilience Planning and Implementation at the county. Um, fortunately, un unlike Palm Beach, we have a staff of over 20, so I would say we're a very well-resourced Office of Resilience there, fortunately for us. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide. Um, and, you know, we, we take a very uh, broad view of resilience. Um, you know, essentially what we're working on is preparing for and responding to long-term stresses and short-term shocks in our system. Um, particularly, you know, address, even going as far as addressing, you know, some of the chronic stresses like housing affordability, which is a major issue for us here in Miami-Dade County. Um, we have many communities that are low and moderate income, but we also um, beyond that have many communities where, where individuals are cost burdened, spending you know, a significant amount of their income on their housing, which makes them less able to adapt to and respond to, to climate related um, shocks and stresses. Okay, we can go on from there. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're quite a large office and we have several sections. Um, we have sections that focus on mitigation, adaptation, we have our communication section um, that also oversees our amazing newsletter, which, which I would recommend you all um, subscribe to. Uh, we, we have a specific division focused on Biscayne Bay and extreme heat. And my section, which is the, the future ready section focused on um, the implement, planning and implementation of our resilience initiatives. Okay, we can go on from there. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit. Um, we, we have a, a mayor in Miami-Dade County that's very passionate about climate action, um, which is one of the re reasons we have such great resources in our Office of Resilience. Um, and she's also very passionate about um, engaging with the community and allowing them to, to um, define how, how our, our government operates. Um, so she initiated the, the Thrive 305 Action Plan. Um, which was our largest public engagement initiative in, in our government's history. Um, it incorporated the feedback um, through, received from the community through surveys and workshops. Um, I think we had over 26,000 responses to our survey. And what came of it was the blueprint um, for, for um, county government and, and how we should collaborate with our, our civic partners. And uh, not surprisingly, community-driven resilience was I identified as a, a major priority from that effort. Okay, we can go on. Oh, and also importantly is that it led to the creation of my position. Um, so in Miami-Dade County, we, we have several connected strategies. Um, we have our resilient 305 strategy, um, which is a partnership between Miami-Dade County, City of Miami, Miami Beach, and the Miami Foundation, which is a community-based organization. And uh, we work together to identify collaborative strategies to address climate change. And this provides the broad framework for our other more detailed strategies, such as our sea level rise strategy, our climate action strategy, and our extreme heat action plan. Okay, you can go on from there. And uh, it, it really focuses on addressing uh, resilience through these three avenues, places, people, and pathways. Um, and as I mentioned, it gives the broad framework for our more detailed initiatives and uh, really ensures that we, we keep the focus um, 
such such as equity that it, it pervades throughout all of our our other initiatives okay we can go on uh, so what we know in in miami-dade county um, is that transportation and land use um, is the primary driver it's the primary source of our greenhouse gas emissions in our community, followed by buildings and energy, then by water and waste. And so the county um, released its climate action strategy to try to address uh, these sources. Okay, we can go on. And we have the established target of trying to reduce emissions by 50% from 2019 levels by 2030 and to reach net zero by 2050. And we can go on to the next slide and it will show um, how we're doing in that respect. Um, unfortunately, um, so the red line is showing the trajectory that we're on without our climate action strategy implementation. As you can see, greenhouse gas emissions would be expected to continue to rise as they have done historically. Um, with the climate action strategy, um, we can reduce it, but even even with it, there's uh, a gap there that, that needs to be met. And, you know, that one of the challenges we face is that, um, you know, I think that we've been very proactive about addressing um, those sources that, that the county has direct control over our own operations and stuff like that. But it's obviously more challenging. We, we need community based reductions also to reach those goals. Um, so, and that that obviously becomes a bit more challenging, which is where, you know, engagement and collaboration becomes so important. Okay, we can go on from there. So these are our um, seven approaches to reach our goals. Um, it in includes um, benchmarking for f um, buildings, energy benchmarking, um, reducing um, on-site energy generation, um, building ultra low energy buildings, reducing transportation related fuel consumption, expanding and protecting green and blue spaces, converting waste to energy and reducing our waste and water use. Okay, next slide. Uh, so this is, these are some examples of, of how we're um, collaborating and engaging both regionally and locally. Um, Megan already did a great job of, of providing an overview of the Regional Climate Change Compact, so I won't dwell too much on that. Um, we also have um, our Regional Clean Cities Coalition, which um, engages both public and private entities um, to work on um, the conversion primarily to electric vehicles within our area. Um, locally, we have our 305 Collaborative. Um, which is an academic government research partnership. Um, so we engage with our, our local um, academic institutions and non-governmental organizations on climate related issues. We have our 35 and the 305, um, which refers to a collaboration between the county and our 34 municipalities to plan uh, for, to address climate change issues together. Uh, most recently, we're all working on creating vulnerability assessments within our state um, to meet new requirements within our state law. Um, so we're working together through our collaborative to make sure that our vulnerability assessments um, correspond. And um, Im importantly, we're, we're also, um, I facilitate a youth engagement roundtable, um, which was an initiative created by our major, our mayor to engage young people between 15 and 25 that are um, engaged on climate action within our community to connect them with county government so that they can um, uh, provide us with recommendations for how to enhance um, our, our climate policies, our climate related policies. Okay, next slide. Uh, Megan already touched on the um, sea level rise projections developed by the Regional Climate Change Compact. So we can go to the next slide. Um, and obviously what we know is that we're, we're one of the most, in Southeast Florida, we're one of the most vulnerable areas in the world to the impacts of sea level rise. Um, it's estimated that by 2040, we'll have $4.2 billion in property value um, at risk 
um, due to daily tidal inundation. Okay, we can go to the next slide. And what, what we also know is that um, efforts pre-disaster um, adaptation efforts are uh, have, have an excellent benefit cost ratio for about every dollar we spend in pre-disaster um, hardening efforts, we would see about $4 in benefit versus, you know, a post-disaster um, strategy. So, and I've even heard that as much as six. So it's, it's incredibly beneficial to spend more money um, preparing our community for the impacts of disasters and uh, climate change than to spend it on the back end after a disaster occurs. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So the county released its sea level rise strategy, which includes recommendations for adapting to sea level rise. Um, there are 10 of them. Um, essentially, it, you know, it, it talks about building higher, either building on fill or on pylons, expanding blue ways and green ways, and building on high ground close to transit. It also emphasizes using localized adaptation planning. Here in Florida, we have something called adaptation action areas, which are recognized um, in our state law um, as um, geographically discrete areas where we can, that are vulnerable um, to the impacts of climate change, where we can direct our funding. Um, so we use that as, as a tool to engage with the plan, with the community on a more localized level. Um, to plan for resilience. And we've already taken steps to update our codes, such as updates to our county flood criteria, which sets the minimum height for um, fill material needed on a property and the height of seawalls um, to, to consider 2060 sea level rise scenarios. So we're also updating our codes to make sure that new development happening is going to be resilient into the future. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Um, we've also updated our stormwater master planning effort to account for um, 2060 sea level rise projections and make sure that um, our infrastructure improvements that we're planning for there um, are taking us well into the future. Okay, we can go to the next slide. I'm going to pick it up here a bit. Okay, and, um, and we're trying to lead by example through our internal operations, which is obviously where we have the opportunity to make the greatest impact. Um, beginning in 2021, we had a mandate from our mayor to um, have at least 10% of our annual light fleet purchases to be battery electric, and that has to increase by an additional 10% each year thereafter, with the goal of converting our entire light fleet by 2030. Um, we're also working to um, uh, convert our heavy fleet. Uh, we we have um, we had about 40 buses, electric buses in operation, and we just purchased another 75, which which means about 10% now of our heavy fleet um, are, are low and no emission vehicles. Um, also, our county projects have to be designed with consideration of sea level rise over the design life of the project or 50 years, whichever is greater. Um, we have a sustainable buildings ordinance that requires our, our projects to be uh, LEED Silver certified and include benchmarking, cool roofs, electric vehicle charging, life cycle cost analysis. And we're also working through our procurement process to make sure that um, even down to the pencils that we purchase um, are the most um, environmentally friendly option. Um, and we're actually in the process of updating that to um, make it even more stringent. So we can go on to the next slide. Um, we're also, uh, Biscayne Bay is, is a really important asset to us um, here locally. And um, we, we have some areas of the bay that um, have experienced seagrass die off um, because of contaminants going into the bay, which is obviously a problem also for our, our long-term sustainability. Seagrass is an excellent carbon, it has excellent carbon sequestering capacity. Um, so we're, we're working diligently to try to um, improve the health of our bay. We can go to the next slide. And, uh, you know, we do that through several different initiatives um, and, and most importantly, engaging the community um, through cleanups, um, education, such as our, our license plate 
uh, initiative and also through our regulations such as our fertilizer ordinance. And, and we uh, created a report card to help communicate to the community the health of the Bay. Okay, we can go on. And uh, just the last issue is extreme heat. Um, I'll, I'll just say that um, in Miami-Dade County, um, it's likely by mid-century that we'll have over 88 days per year with a heat index of 105 degrees or greater. Um, so our county um, designated the world's first chief heat officer. And just recently in December, we released our extreme heat action plan to try to address this issue, um, which uh, is, is most important in our low and moderate income communities where there tends to be less, less tree canopy um, that, and, and with outdoor workers that are, that are more exposed to the impacts. Okay, we can go on from there. I think that's my last slide. Yep, we can go on from there. Yep, that's our first chief heat officer, <laughs> Jane Gilbert. Okay, I think the last, yep. So I thank you very much for your time and for hosting me. Um, thank you so much, ladies, for, for joining me. And um, I'd like to open, we have, I guess, Gina, if you want to help, or Jen, if you want to help facilitate the last few minutes of the call, sure. um, we're open for questions and discussion. Sure. Uh, maybe stop sharing your screen so we can see if there's hands raised. There were a few questions that came in through the chat that I saw. Um, one of them earlier on when you were talking about the Youth Climate Summit, it's really super fun to see all your incredible work on the summits. And youth engagement was around what were, oh, what types of activities do students seem most excited about? And that's coming from Ingrid in Ithaca. Yeah, and um, yeah, kids are excited about what we'd be excited about, something that can make a difference. So we try to, you know, ask them what they'd like to do to make a difference and then help them frame it to something they can actually accomplish, right? So they're not just writing about it and thinking about it, they can actually do something. Um, I was trying to get, I'm waiting to get the video from the 10th event. I saw a clip though, and one student said, you know, he can ride his bike to school. That was like, that was a fifth grader. Then the eighth grader would be works on, or in the, and the high school students we have, they're the ones that are petitioning city councils to get rid of plastic straws or plastic bags and actually going the policy route to make a difference. Yeah. And just echoing what Lisa said, uh, we're seeing similar things here in Palm Beach County. They love being a part of the solution. They love uh, educating others. And so that's actually really the purpose of our program is that teaching these teens, the, the youth, to be our next leaders. Um, and and they, they thrive on it. They, um, we, Megan showed some pictures of the event that we attended last week uh, with uh, the West Palm Beach and the Hokie and Bell Blade groups. Um, they, they were just beaming uh, with pride as we were, um, as I was taking them home, actually, they said it was, it was the highlight of their week. Uh, just seeing the process take place among the community members themselves, um, not just seeing it on TV or, or thinking or talking about it in class, but actually being a part of that solution. I also mentioned uh, there's a storybook lesson that we uh, developed with our program that's been incredibly impactful, um, not just for our, our teens but our, or our little ones for that matter, but also the adults, um, it showed up in a principal's meeting in Palm Beach County that it was an unexpected um, presentation, kind of an informal presentation of it, and it's getting a lot of attention, uh, but certainly has been very uh, impactful in, for, for everyone of all ages. Great, thank you. I see a number of questions coming in. So um, if Frank, Christy, and then Jim, so hold on one second. Um, so from Frank, how do you think education, community engagement, and workforce capacity will help close the emissions gap in the counties? Well, I, I would just chime in that, um, you know, as, as I, I mentioned in our um, greenhouse gas emissions trajectory that, um, you know, there's there's only so much we anticipate can be done from from government action directly. I mean, there, there has to be action within the community and to, you know, make personal 
personal lifestyle changes and, and help move the needle. Okay, great. Thanks, Kimberly. And this next question might be for you as well um, from Christy. Um, and I also, this res this question resonated with me too, Christy. So liking the connections between the young adults, the 15 to 25 year olds that you were mentioning in that youth engagement roundtables, and then county governments, and what are some of their recommendations that you've heard coming from young people around what the county should do? I think that's what the question is. Yeah, um, so a lot of what we're hearing, um, we, we've we've heard the desire for bold action, such as the declaration of, of a climate emergency. Um, I will say they're they're probably most interested of that in that occurring at the federal level, where where there are um, additional funding strings tied to that that kind of declaration. Um, but they've also pushed for it at the county level. Um, I will say that our you know even absent a formal declaration, our mayor recognizes that that it's a climate emergency and, and is planning accordingly. Um, the other things we've heard is a strong focus on making our, our transit system more user friendly um, so that we can get people out of their, their vehicles and, and onto transit, um, as well as a focus on the transition to electric vehicles. They're also incredibly focused on um, school curriculum, um, you know, a, a more climate related curriculum in the schools, which the county doesn't directly influence, but we do have partnerships with Miami-Dade County Public Schools um, that where we try to encourage um, that type of action. Great, thank you so much. And then uh, Jim, you have a question. I see your hand up. Great, thank you, Jen. Uh, thank you, everybody. It's very excited about this. Florida. Florida has a lot of great stuff going on. This is really wonderful. So, Carolyn, I mean, you've got a lot of friends. It's not as bad sometimes as sometimes it sounds. It's really good. Um, question would be of, do you think that young people in your program would be interested, and would you have the capacity to encourage this, where um, the students I work with, the students I know in California, uh, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, love to talk with students who are doing taking action in other parts of the country to learn from each other to share with each other to not feel that you know it's just our part of the country that's doing this do you think students would be interested in that and related to it i'll, I'll do this up if they're talking to students do you, do you feel comfortable if we're looking at there's different ways in which people directly take action and if i have it right um a lot of the students that you're, you're working with, they're focused on policy change and talking with government and elected officials. Absolutely important, really important. Would would it be off? Would it be taking them up too much to talk also about there are young people who take action by being climate educators themselves? They're in education. There are young people who actually are innovators in STEM. They literally are making change in not having climate change be so serious, right? Uh, to reduce that. There are young people who are specifically doing all, any or all of the above, but very much paying attention to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and social justice, seeing that we break the barrier that these subjects are restricted to white people, right? You know, that there's a lot of, historically, these are areas, if we have STEM people, people in that, you're talking white people because people of color are kept out. And young people have the ability to say, well, we're, we're gonna do it our way and we're gonna do it diverse and start to break it down. Anyway, would any of these do you think would be interested to your students to talk with other students? And we all learn from each, they, they all learn from each other. Thank you. I, I'd like to speak to that. I'm excited to hear from you um, regarding some kind of connection or, or collaboration. I will say in our summer institute, we did at connect our students with um, leaders across um, globally uh, with FXB and um, there was another organization I can't think of, um, but we would love to connect. And in terms of them being educators, that is actually a big portion of our program is that the teens do become educators. Um, I, I witnessed uh, one event one, one afternoon with our storybook lesson. Um, what we do is we have them identify helpers in a climate resilience uh, situation. And by the end of the lesson, one of the kids said, oh, I wanna be an architect now. You know, I wanna help my community. And so it's, it's, uh, it's been really powerful. Thank you so much, Jim, for sharing uh, that information. And I'd love to connect with you. 
Yeah, same here. We have a program, especially in our middle schools, that was using Global Scholars, but is now doing a custom curriculum, and they're looking for other classrooms to talk to and work together on projects. And as the STEM supervisor, I would love if they did STEM projects. We have a partnership with SciStarter, so we encourage them to do citizen science projects. And, you know, I see change, looking at, at collecting data to see when they see, like, thing, like the orchid in my house blooming a month earlier. But, you know, monitoring that data, recording data, and helping out scientists with collect, data collection through SciStarter. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say in Miami-Dade County, we have um, Dream in Green. Um, yeah. So it sounds it sounds like in each county, maybe we have something different, which I think uh, maybe speaks to the point you were mentioning the need for a, yeah. a broader network of all of these different um, county based initiatives. Uh -huh. We have Dream and Green also works with us. And they've been a sponsor of the summit for the past few years. And Clio as well works across counties. So great. Thank you. Uh, Ginger, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to remind folks that when you're talking to the kids that that um, not <laughs> and I didn't see it overly pushed, but but, you know, writ large in the education systems, the focus on STEM is so mm -hmm. overbearing and we really need electricians right now. And that is not a STEM. I mean, it is, it but is. it's not college bound. And we, we're yeah. not going to electrify without electricians. We need plumbers mm -hmm. to develop new pump systems to keep your streets dry. Um, and so not only are there jobs in STEM fields, but they're going to be jobs for skilled workforce um, kids. And the girls should be considering those degrees to, or those fields of study as well. It shouldn't all be men still. Thank you, Ginger, for saying that, actually. And some of our um, kids were choosing, you know, non-college track um, helpers, such as firefighters, um, even a mayor, which isn't necessarily a college track, um, and um, various other careers. You're absolutely right. 100%. I support that. Thank you. Okay, we just have a couple minutes left. Are there any final um, questions for this amazing panel this afternoon? I had a question actually. Um, I was really curious about what happens on the, I think it was maybe part four, Lisa, that you were describing the climate action yeah. piece and how that's different from the other parts of the summit. And are you having students and I guess a part of this question was like, do you have students that participate in all of these things? And they're sort of like, or like, do you have like a group of like some materials or youth leaders that are like ambassadors? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the summit in December, this is our first year of doing four of them, four parts, because it grows every year. Um, the summit in December were high school students and our core group, and they overlapped because they also went to the February and then our eighth graders that went to February are going to be the group that comes to the museum in um, the part four. So it's going to be eighth grade, um, which are almost ninth graders, so that they have four years to accomplish their goals if they come up with some big grand scheme of task and see Summers on so she can help explain it also. Um, the reason it's 250 is because that's what fits in the IMAX theater. It's really all based on log logistics of limited time trying to get everyone to work together. And it will be probably working on projects. The idea is that they'd be able to work on projects that they can work on across schools. So if they come up with something that would be over the county, within our system, they can build a project. We can do crowdsourcing data collection. They can come up with projects that we could use not only in the school, but across the community. So. And I know one thing we're going to add to that is careers. We're going to have um, a working lunch with um, a bunch of professionals um, in the community talking to kids about what they do and how the action plans that they're working on can, can lead into careers in, in their backyard. That's great. I'd love to talk to you all more because we have our youth climate program at, at the Wild Center and also NOAA Project Grantee. So we'd love, um, we're also thinking the scaffolding thing that you're talking about with like the eighth graders and the older kids and like 
we have a lot of interest in elementary age summits right now. Mm -hmm. And so we're really thinking about this like sort of scaffolding approach. And I'd love, I would love to talk more about this. So yeah. I'm going to reach out to you. I've been writing, taking notes. Yeah, thank you. This was the first year we had fifth graders attending and they yeah. were, they were great. I don't think we had any fifth graders last we, year. We had fifth graders. Well, fifth graders virtually we had. Virtual, but the um, interest from the elementary teachers from for us is huge. They huge, really want, yeah. we, if they would let us, we would get second and third graders. We have to cap it because of numbers and busing, but the elementary teachers are very interested mm -hmm. in bringing the students. Yeah, and we did virtual. We definitely had whole elementary schools tuning in, which was great. Yeah. That's really great. Well, I know we're at time, everybody, and um, but I would just like thank you so much. This was such a great presentation. I really appreciated the blend of both having the education and then the planning and resilience perspectives, and it just was really fantastic. So thank you to your whole team and great work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, especially to Rachel for putting this together. Thank you. Out. Thank you, ladies, for joining me. And yeah. I'm so glad that we were able to, to share our perspective. So thank you. Thank you. Very yes, thank you all. Thanks, Great everybody. Work. Thank you. Have a great week. Thanks, Jen. Okay. Take care. See you soon. Bye.